Um, welcome to the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation's presentation of Medicine in Our Backyard. This is a really popular and great series. This series is generously sponsored by Mike and Polly Smith and UC Irvine Health. This, collabor this collaboration between UCI and the Library Foundation allows us access to Irvine's extraordinary doctors and provide a free community resource, and one that keeps on giving as all these lectures are available on our website at nbplfoundation.org. So you can watch it over and over and over again. Um, my name is Meg Linton, and I have the good fortune of being the new CEO of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. This is my second lecture. Uh, I'm thrilled you are all here so we can learn together about bioidentical hormonal restoration this evening. We are honored to have Dr. Marcela Dominguez, who will be discussing, as I said, bioidentical hormonal restoration. And Dr. Dominguez completed her Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology at UCLA, obtained her MD from UC San Diego, then completed her family medicine residency at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center. During this time, she received the Mead Johnson Leadership Award, which annually recognizes 15 residents nationwide for their leadership and community involvement. Dr. Dominguez served as the chief resident for obstetrics at Long Beach Memorial, delivering hundreds of babies and increasing her expertise in reproductive and hormonal health. For six years, Dr. Dominguez built a thriving group practice at St. Jude Heritage Health Foundation in Diamond Bar, California, which further prepared her for opening her private practice in July 2006. Dr. Dominguez is one of a handful of doctors in the country who is an expert in combining Western and alternative therapies to provide state-of-the-art bioidentical hormone replacement, functional medicine, nutrition, and herbal therapy, and highly customized complementary, complementary and integrated protocol. Expanding her medical expertise in care in 20. 13, Dr. Dominguez completed a fellowship in integrative cancer therapies at the Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. I'm tired after all of that work. <laughs> um, yeah, please welcome Dr. Dominguez. Hello. How's everybody doing? All right. Does anybody feel the need to stand up and stretch? No? We're all good? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. That was a that, that's a very lengthy biography. I'm going to have to shorten that. But I've been, I've been many places in my professional journey, and I think it's important to know that because a lot of people ask me, how did you end up where you are as a physician? Because I'm a UC kid. I you know, went to UCLA, then UC San Diego, and Long Beach Memorial is a UCI a residency program. So I really am a product of excellent education through the UC system. And yet, what we're going to be talking about today is really not from that education. It's something I learned after the fact. So I always had an interest in natural therapies and, and vitamins, herbs. I took electives. I took nutritional courses. Wasn't really quite sure how to implement that and integrate it into a conventional family medicine practice. But I navigated my way around and, and started to encompass both sides. So I truly am an integrative physician. I don't completely abandon my conventional training. I think there's value there. But I also just expanded my resources that I can offer to patients. So I just say I have a bigger toolbox. That's all. <laughs> I have more tools in my toolbox. So when people come to me, I, I try to explore at a very deep level underlying reasons why they don't feel well and then try to always incorporate restoring optimal health because I'm a true believer that if we restore optimal health, your body will perform optimally for you. And realize though, we live in an environment that can make it very challenging for us to do that, but the more we tend to proactively allow that to happen, the better results you're going to get. So this particular topic, people ask me, do you mean bioidentical replacement? I say no, I mean bioidentical restoration hormone restoration, because we all still make hormones. All of us in this room, regardless of your age, are making some level of hormones. So for postmenopausal women, it's primarily coming from your adrenal glands. And even for my men who are over the age of 50, your testicles are making less testosterone, but your adrenal glands can still pitch in testosterone and DHEA. So we are always making some level of hormones. So I really feel that we need to bring that along and to help support those systems because your body's trying to help you. 
So Dr. Edward Lichten, he is an ob doctor who has written some very good books, but he specialized now close to 50 years when he wrote this quote, the body can most often heal itself if supplied with proper building blocks of vitamins, minerals, fats, and especially bioidentical hormones. I believe successful treatment of disease involves a partnership between the doctor and his patient. The doctor first as educator, the patient in turn brings her or his experience with the disease and treatment outcomes back to the physician. And both do this with a deep sense of trust and humanity. So I partner with my patients. I really want their input. I want them to be proactively involved. And I want to answer whatever questions they may have because if we do that, and if I do an adequate job of doing that, they walk away knowing what to do and they are motivated to do that because they really believe they're going to get the results they wanted. So what, we're going to talk about hormones. So what is a hormone? It's a substance that is produced in a tissue. It's released into the bloodstream, and then it travels throughout your body using the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. And then it ends up at its target site, and it has receptors to bind and go into the cell. Or they're small enough that they can actually travel through the cell membrane. So they have ways to get into the cell that way. And then it starts turning on different regulators and signaling actions there. So why would we ever consider replacing the hormones? I mean, aren't we naturally designed to just have less and less as time goes on? Yes, but we have to realize that if we want to maximize our quality of life, yet our hormones start to diminish significantly in our 40s and 50s, and we still have another 40, 50 years to live, your quality of life is going to be impacted and your a possibility of picking up any kind of a chronic illness is going to start rising quite significantly. So we want to do something about that. We want to be proactive about that. So I do feel that postmenopausal hormone therapy is an effort to reduce specific symptoms. How many of you women, I'm just going to pick on the women for just a moment, how many of you either have gone through perimenopause or recall how your perimenopausal days and you really needed a little bit of help and assistance through that time? I'm raising my hand because I am currently going through what I've been talking about for the last 18 years. And yeah, I, I do my own little bioidentical hormonal restoration program because I'm kicking off those covers and it's hot and I'm sweaty and then I'm tossing and turning. I can't get a good night's sleep. And then my emotional ability is up and down. My heart will start to flutter from time to time. I'll hear a little jingle on the radio to, to work, like a commercial jingle and I wanna cry, you know, over like, you know, pampers, diapers. I mean, this is silly, I don't do that, but I'm doing it now. So it's, it's kind of an out of body experience, but it's all real. And I know that I'm at the time in my life that those hormones hormones are changing and these are byproduct symptoms. So we can kind of level off those big peaks and valleys and kind of make them smaller, but we have to do it in a way that's very safe too. So listed down here are some of the common symptoms that I was just telling you about. So it, it's intended to be kind of a shorter term course, at least the original thought was just to kind of take that tumultuous journey and kind of level it out a little bit and then as soon as you start to feel better we'll take them away. That philosophy has definitely changed. One of the most common questions my patients will ask me is, Doctor, how long do you think I should take my hormones? And that's a loaded question. Every year that I go to my bioidentical hormone lectures or I read a new article, I read a new book, I'm always paying attention to that question because it can change year to year and study to study and patient to patient. So I always tell my patients, the current literature, if you're doing it properly, using a biologically identical molecule of hormone versus something synthetic, using the lowest effective dose and having regular monitoring, and partnering with somebody who's well-educated in bioidentical hormones, you probably want to stay on it for a long period of time unless there's something that comes up in your health that changes that. So for me, knowing what I know, I will probably be on some kind of a bioidentical hormone restoration program for my entire life because I want maximum quality of life and I want all of the preventative aspects that I can get that my body just can't give me, so. Okay, so last two decades, more emphasis on preventative health benefits from hormone replacement and women are living longer, men are living longer and we really do 
not only want a better quality of life, we demand a better quality of life. And I think all of us should be trying to achieve that at no compromise to risk factors for health, illness, and disease in the future. So I always like to bring in some medical history. I, I was just sharing with somebody earlier that I'm a bit of a medical nerd. Whenever something happens in medicine, I kind of want to go back and find out, how do we get here? So I'm going to take you all the way back to 1889. <laughs> Just really quickly, I'll bring, to, bring you to the future or to the current uh, for, um, in just a little bit here. But in 1889, there was a physician who self-administered testicular extracts and felt rejuvenated and claimed females would feel the same with ovarian extract. So the idea was planted there in 1897. British articles stated that ovarian extracts can help f help women with hot flashes. So back in these days, you had extracts from organs, and these extracts from these organs came from an animal. So it can come from a pig, or it can come from a cow. I would say pig and cow, so bovine for cow and porcine for pig, would be the most common ways that you would extract these hormone molecules, and you would just purify them out, and then you would give them back to the patient. So 1927, we've got the first American patient who was treated for menopausal symptoms using cattle amniotic fluid. So with the same concept that they're gonna extract some hormones from that. 1929, we've got a molecule of estrone, which is one type of estrogen your body makes, and it was isolated from a pregnant woman's urine. And I have something to say about this because in China, thousands of years ago, the Chinese women elderly Chinese women would drink the urine of the younger Chinese women. And this, the concept was that their, their urine is very rich in estrogens. And these women benefited from that. That was just, it, it could probably still be in practice now, but it was definitely the norm to do that. And so I, I just find that really fascinating and it makes sense. <laughs> 1934, we've got progesterone, which is another sex hormone molecule. These molecules, by the way, they're made by men and women. Women obviously make more estrogen and progesterone, but men do make these as well. And there are men that want to make sure that they're getting a little bit of progesterone production for its protective aspect against prostate cancer. And estrone can be made in abundance if you carry a lot of midsection weight. So. Both men and women do that, but a lot of men might carry their weight in their midsection, and they're gonna be converting their testosterone over to something like estrone, and that may not be such a good idea. Okay, 1936, we have ovarian hormone isolated from tons of pig ovaries. We're talking buckets and buckets of pig ovaries here in order to isolate a small volume to serve a very few number of patients. I know, it's so sad, little puggies. Anyway. <laughs> So that's not going to be practical, but they did it, okay? 1941 comes along and they say, you know, this is not practical, but Ayerst, who by the way, Ayerst is a pharmaceutical company that's still around. They created uh, pregnant, they created estrogen from pregnant mare's urine. It was less volume, water soluble. They didn't need to go through this laborious process. And it was approved, it was called Premarin because it stands for pregnant mare's urine urine, in case you ever wonder where they got Premarin from, <laughs> that's what it is. It was approved for use in Canada in 1941, and in 1942 it was available in the United States. So Premarin gained popularity when Dr. Robert Wilson, who was a physician, I believe he was an obstetrician, gynecologist, he wrote a bestseller called Feminine Forever in 1966. Okay, so when he wrote this book, he basically said every woman needs to be on Premarin. And, and yes, he was uh, financially supported through Ayerst to write a book like this. It was part of the marketing strategy to sell Premarin. So anyway, this was back in 1966. And they learned probably within about five years, it wasn't that much time, I don't know the exact date, but unopposed estrogen use. What that means is giving a woman who has a uterus Premarin or, or estrogen only, you're going to grow that endometrial lining, the inside of the uterus, and then they started to find that there was a very high correlation between using Premarin and severe breakthrough uterine bleeding, and then there was an increased risk of endometrial cancer. So to counterbalance that risk, Wyeth Ayers partnered together, and they made a product called Medroxyprogesterone. That's called Provera, and that uh, they so they partnered 
so they took up John's product, Medroxy Progesterone, and added it to Premarin. And this created the product called PremPro to address this risk of bleeding and uterine cancer concern. So back in 1941 and 42, when Premarin was now FDA approved, so it had been approved 30 years prior to any formal studies being done on it. <laughs> I find that quite fascinating. That would never happen these days, but that's what happened then. So uh, this is when the first qualitative analysis of Premarin occurred 30 years later in the United States, and other studies were done around that time showing that there were 10 different estrogens present. There are actually many more. So a pregnant mare's urine and the variety of estrogens found in it do not match your body. Okay, they're very different. So whenever people say to me, isn't a hormone a hormone, and does it really matter, you know, if it comes from an animal or if it's slightly altered, and I say it really does matter. Here's a perfect example of that. So you have a molecule, uh, these are bioidentical molecules that our bodies make. Here's a molecule of testosterone, and here's a molecule of, molecule of estradiol, another form of bioidentical estrogen in the body, and there is an enzyme called aromatase that converts the two. Look at how similar these two are. You have a double bond oxygen here, and you have a single bond OH, and then up in this area you have an OH, and then you have the same, but it is probably one's pointing into the into the projector screen and one's pointing out of it. And then you have the CH3 group, methyl group, and you don't have it here. These look very, very similar to each other, but these two molecules could not do the most polar opposite things in your body. So when people say to me, well, Provera or progesterone, what does it matter? They're pretty close to each other. And I say, well, I, I will grant you that they both have the ability to hook onto that receptor and get into the cell but the progesterone molecule has the map to navigate all the different places to go, and that Provera molecule, medroxyprogesterone, doesn't have a clue of where to go, so it's gonna bump into things and do things that it shouldn't be doing and cause trouble. Does that make sense? So be, we're, be well aware that a little difference goes a long way here. So here's the progesterone molecule, and here is medroxyprogesterone. So, you know, the, the backbone ring, which is the cholesterol ring, Hormones are made from cholesterol, and we all should be careful not to try to lower our cholesterol too far, because then you don't have the precursor molecules to make your hormones, and that's a problem. So I, I partner very well with my cardiology colleagues, but I'm not so agreeable when they tell my patients to lower their LDL below 100. I have a real problem with that, because the precursor molecule for sex hormones is the LDL cholesterol molecule. So you know, you have to take each person individually, but I don't think that we should make a blanket statement there. So, bless you. Okay. Oh, that's an important slide. Does anybody in the audience have any of these symptoms? <laughs> <laughs> or does anyone have all of them? <laughs> oh, boy. I have a lot of these right now. But uh, I will tell you it makes a big difference when you take the right hormones and the right supplements and the right lifestyle too. I mean, I had to make some adjustments to my lifestyle in order to balance my hormones a little bit better. But these are, this is just a selection of common symptoms that you can have when your hormones are not balanced. So it's, there are many more, but these are the common ones. Okay, so what's happening in the body? Well, what we know is that as time goes on, your hormones do become more imbalanced, and that has to do with the fact that physiologically, your ovaries and your testicles cannot make enough hormones to supply the demand. So your adrenal glands, which sit right on top of your kidney, so ad renal, ad meaning on top of renal, on top of your kidney, so right about mid-back, and they're about walnut size, are very, very important. They have the ability to make sex hormones, and they get recruited big time during this transition time. So for women, perimenopause, and for men, it's andropause. You do have a transition time in your lives to men. So we all go through this transition period where the demand is higher than the supply. Our adrenal glands try to make up for it, but we tend to live in a chronically high-stress environment. So now you're asking these already tired adrenal glands to do one more big thing. Imagine how that might feel. If you work at your job, and I'm gonna use my UCI 
friends in the back because they told me that two ladies went out on maternity leave <laughs> recently <laughs> and they hired one extra person. So everybody's going to have to work a little harder and they're already working really hard. I'm sure that doesn't come across great. You're like, all right, good to do this for four months. But your adrenal glands are going to say the same thing. I'm already really busy managing your day-to-day -day stress and your week-to-week -week stress. I'm trying to help control your blood pressure. I'm trying to control your electrolytes. I'm trying to support your immune system. I'm trying to balance your sugar. And now you're asking me to make more sex hormones? What's going on here? So, you know, they, they're not too happy about it. And they, they try their best, but they also cannot satisfy that demand. So you can understand that if you lower your stress and balance your life a little better, your adrenals can help you a little bit more. And you can take some adrenal supporting natural herbs and vitamins. You'll be able to help yourself a little bit more. And there are patients I see who refuse to take any hormones, any prescription hormones. They want to do it all naturally. So we can do that. There, there is definite improvement by putting together the right program for you yourself. So uh, other disruptive factors here down below are things in the environment that can disrupt hormones, plastics, chemicals, toxins. These are all commonly found in our world. You can take things into your body that can cause inflammation, the things that you're consuming in your diet, the toxins in your air, water, and soil. And if you're taking synthetically altered hormones, like we were showing you with that Provera molecule before and the Premarin. If you get UV rays that can cause DNA damage, either from sun or microwave, electromagnetic frequency waves, those would be things like your microwaves and your cordless phones, cordless anything, uh, your cell towers, all of these things are giving off very damaging uh, energy that can cause DNA damage. You can have nutritional insufficiencies and you can be eating foods that have been depleted in the soil because the soil has been used over and over and over again. And not only that, but we're adding insecticides and pesticides and fungicides and we're spilling all of that into the soil so your food ends up being nutritionally depleted. You could be taking medications. So even if you have a blood pressure medication, a cholesterol lowering medication, a proton pump inhibitor to lower your acid because you suffer from reflux, all of these drugs in combination, and now you're gonna throw in a hormone, it's not a vacuum that you're throwing that hormone into. It's gonna to have to be factored in and your liver and your kidneys and your digestive system are gonna to have to deal with that. So you do have to factor all of these things in. Okay, so perimenopause, as I mentioned, is a time, at least for women, that we are going to notice, most of us will notice some change. Even if you go through this very smoothly, you will notice that there's a change in your menstrual cycle. You'll probably notice a little bit of change in your sleep pattern, in your ability to handle stress. You might start to develop a couple of headaches, which you've never had before. So it could be mild but you might discover that your body does show you some symptoms. So on average, about 46, between the ages of 39 and 51 would be considered a normal range. There are people who are outside of that range. And it usually lasts for about five years. So that's a long time to feel pretty badly if you're having a lot of symptoms. And you have menstrual regularity. Most women are cycling every 24 to 35 days, so it starts changing from the normal pattern and you start having estrogen levels in the form of estradiol and estrone, they start to become erratic. And you start to get temperature instability because of the erratic release. So a lot of women say, I need estrogen because I'm hot flashing. And I say, well, you need estrogen or maybe even progesterone instead because your levels are going like this, high, low, high, low. I need to level you out. Once I level that level out, whether it's with something natural or with progesterone or maybe a little bit of estrogen to kind of take over that, you won't have this erratic cycle. Therefore, you won't have these crazy temperature instability changes. But it's not a deficient state because how many of you can attest to this. You've, you've been far enough away from those perimenopausal, menopausal years. You're not making hardly any estrogens on your own anymore. And you don't continue to hot flash, right? It tends to go away with time. So if it truly was a deficient state, you would be having terrible hot flashes until your last days, and that doesn't happen. Okay. So we've got a couple other hormonal changes with perimenopause. FSH and LH go up and you cannot ovulate if your FSH starts to get above 20. So whenever women, you go to your 
OB-GYN doctor or your family doctor and you say, am I really in menopause? I want to know. They might, they might send this level off. And we use, by definition, anything over 25 to be a definition of menopause, at least by lab. It might take you a while to stop bleeding. And once you stop bleeding for one year, retroactively, that date, one year prior, is your menopausal date. So it is a retroactive definition that way. You have a change in your sex hormone binding globulin. This binds up some of your free-floating sex hormones. And when you don't have as much of that floating around, you can have some of your male hormones floating around a little bit more. And we start to develop whiskers. How many of you have little whiskers? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, so that's part of the reason. And uh, so there is an explanation for that. Uh, your adrenal glands start to produce something called androstenedione, which is the molecule that can turn into a form of estrogen called estrone and testosterone. And then the adrenal glands over time, just as part of the aging process, they stop making a hormone called DHEA or dehydroepiandrosterone. You never need to know that, but if, in case you want to know it, that's what it is. It's a male type hormone and it can make testosterone. So for my male patients, I do check their DHEA levels as well as my female patients, but a lot of the time I'll give my male patients a nice healthy dose of DHEA because they're coming in with low testosterone symptoms. And this lecture isn't so much geared toward that, but I don't want to forget my men in the audience because I do see a lot of men for you know, their hormonal needs too. So if they come in and they're having these low T symptoms, you hear the commercials, right? And so they come in and I, I do a full history, I do a full examination, I make sure that their prostate gland is healthy, and then we delve into their adrenal gland health and their, what they're making for themselves. And oftentimes the DHEA levels are quite low, and giving them a nice boost of DHEA alongside whatever else we're doing is a really nice way to support their own body's ability to make more testosterone. It works for women too, but women usually cannot handle a very big dose because they'll have more whiskers and acne. So we don't want those. <laughs> we want some things, but not other things. <laughs> so these are some of the, uh, what we call meso vasomotor instability or erratic hormonal changes. I mentioned that the hormones go up and down, kind of like a Richter scale would. And as a result, you get the hot flashes, night sweats. Um, it tends to be a symptom that's more common with women who had premenstrual symptoms beforehand. So they had those PMS symptoms leading up to their menses, tend to have a harder time with this. And it can last one to five years. And this is probably the most common reason why women come and seek extra help during this time. It's quite disruptive to a lot of different things. The second most common reason, I would say, is probably the vaginal mucosal changes. You get dryness, but it's not just dryness. It's elasticity changes, and the lubrication obviously is not there, but the tissue just doesn't move like it used to. It doesn't feel the way it used to. All of a sudden, what used to be pleasurable before is now prickly and uncomfortable and burns and stings. The tissue becomes thinner, and obviously this is going to affect the comfort of intercourse. That's discomfort during intercourse, and your desire to want to go back and get more of that. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so we want to make it more comfortable, so we look forward to being intimate with our partners. And so all of these things can happen as a result of the vaginal tissue changing. And this is something important. A lot of women will get urethral irritation and they will complain that they're having recurrent bladder infection symptoms and yet we check a urine sample, there's nothing there, nothing's growing. And that's because the tissue around the urethra is doing the same. It's lacking the estrogens that we naturally make and the tissue's becoming thinner, it's becoming stiffer, and it's becoming more sensitive. The pain receptors are becoming more sensitive and so we, We'll check it and then I'll say, you know what? You actually don't have an infection, but we need to give you a little bit of topical estrogen cream. And you can rub it right in that area a couple times a week and it will make a big difference. And I always make sure they drink enough water because if your urine is more concentrated, that's gonna cause more pain. Okay, so we talked about whiskers. Medically, that's hirsutism. And it's an imbalancing act going on, but it's also because you are not binding up these male type hormones very, very naturally like you would when you're making enough of this binding globulin protein. And it's not just the vaginal mucosa that starts to atrophy. You get 
a lot of skin changes. I don't know if you guys have noticed this with your own bodies, but I have a lot of women say to me, it almost seems like overnight I looked in the mirror and, oh my gosh, what happened? I'm five years older. Like my cheeks are sagging. I have nothing under my eyes. I'm wrinkly and my skin's thin and I got these little bruises. I just barely bumped my arm and I got a bruise. And sometimes it seems like it just happens out of nowhere. And, and men can get it too. I think men, they, they hang on to their testosterone longer than, than women do. So I think their skin hangs in there longer, but men will sometimes take even a baby aspirin and then that'll kind of throw it off and cause them to bleed more easily. So estrogens are very important to hormonal health and to skin health. You can have fatigue and headaches, emotional liability, a lot of these symptoms that we were just mentioning on that big board of symptoms, these are all just, they're pointed out to you again. And I don't know about any of you in the room, but this is a very common symptom, the memory and cognitive impairment, what we call a brain fog. You just don't feel as sharp. You don't feel like you can multitask as much. Names, numbers, very kind of specific events that happened recently, like within the last 24 to 48 hours. Like you're sharp as a tack five, 10 years ago, but when you start asking what you had for breakfast yesterday morning, you're like, I don't know, did I have breakfast? Did I eat? Where did I go this past weekend? It's only Monday and I don't remember where I went on Saturday. So these are common symptoms because your brain absolutely needs hormones to work properly. So for men, we have andropause. I mentioned that. That's kind of the medical terminology we use. And their hormonal changes can occur in their 40s and 50s. Sometimes this is what can lead to what we call a midlife crisis, where men are kind of wondering what their purpose in life is, or they want to start doing something different. It could very well be related to their hormonal changes in their body. Their testosterone starts to decline, their DHEA starts to decline, and they can also have low libido. They can start to notice erectile changes, and the erectile changes are usually, and the libido issues are a big reason why they seek medical care. And a lot of my male patients that I do see will share with me that they started off seeing a male provider first, they were more comfortable, but then they're comfortable coming to see me because I'm seeing their wife and their wife is getting quite frisky. And their male partners are like, I'm tired, I wanna go to bed. <laughs> So I tell their wives, I'm like, send your men in to see me. We're going to get you guys on the same playing field again. So this happens, but I'm, I'm very comfortable talking about these kinds of things with my patients. I feel like my men are, are very comfortable sharing. And, you know, it's interesting. I get a lot of information back from my couples. And one of the things I hear sometimes is like, so when's the last time you guys were sexually active? Like, I don't know, it's five, seven years. And, and I'm looking at them going wow, that's a long time. I mean, did you have a healthy sex life before? Yeah, but you know, we just started doing other things and it just kind of fell to the wayside and time kept going on and now more time is going on. And we just, yeah, we just don't do that anymore. And I just like, huh. I said, is your husband or, or your spouse okay with that? Well, I think so. I said, well, I'm here to tell you that, you know, being intimate with your partner is a healthy part of a relationship. So we should kind of delve into this a little bit. Let's kind of go back in time and find out where this all started. And so we kind of delve into it a little bit better, a little bit more. And, and the couples I've been with for a long time, they're very happy that we're kind of exploring that together. It's a very non-threatening environment. And so I, I do, I feel this is a very important part of a relationship. Okay, so menopause, we kind of talked about menopause already. We talked about the fact that around age 51 is when most women go through it, but you can go between 46 and about 55. And the daughters who had, mo daughters of moms with early menopause before 46, they also can tend to experience early menopause. And some of the things that can affect early menopause include smoking, not being well nourished. And this isn't just because you don't have access to food. A lot of females, when they were younger, teenagers, young adults, you know, they struggled with some eating disorders and this can come back around. So it's important to get that history and give that history if you're in the audience talking to your doctor. Eating a vegetarian diet and then being on the thin side, body, body fat less than 10%, could be for men or for women. I tend to see it more in women. Okay, so when you're menopausal and when you're going through andropause, your adrenal glands are gonna be the primary source of hormones. 
um, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and DHEA. And your adrenal glands make 70% less DHEA of a young adult by the time you're 10 years post-menopause or about 10 years post-andropause. That's a tremendously uh, significant decline in your DHEA. And DHEA, I told you earlier, can make testosterone, and it can make all of your estrogens. So there's estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Those are the three kinds of estrogens. And it can also make cortisol, and it can also make what we call glucocorticoids and mineralocorticoids. These are steroid hormones in our bodies that help us with sugar balance and electrolyte balance and blood pressure balance. And some women will say, I'm starting to feel a little bit lightheaded or dizzy. I mean, I kind of feel like I, I'm kind of free falling there for a moment. And that could be the fact that the adrenal glands are trying to make sex hormones, but they're also needing to make these other steroid hormones that have to do with blood pressure control. And a lot of women go into this time period and they're on the low normal side of blood pressure, which is healthy, but they don't have any reserve when they get to this point in their life. So they might feel that change. So some of the long-term health risks if you're a menopausal woman is you have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Menopausal women now match men as far as cardiovascular disease once they go through menopause. They have an equal likelihood of having blocked vessels, having a heart attack, ending up with congestive heart failure equal to men once they're in menopause osteoporosis or bone loss that puts you at very high risk of having a premature and pathological fracture, and then cognitive impairment. So you have cognitive changes that become very medically concerning that we can actually identify as mild cognitive impairment, and then that can lead on to moderate impairment, and then that can lead on to stages of different forms of dementia. So it is progressive and it is important to pick up on these changes earlier than later because there's more that you can do about it and you can really make some changes early on that are reversible. So estrogen plays a lot of different roles, important for ovulation and reproduction. It tends to naturally lower blood pressure um, when you have a healthy lining of your uterus and it can help with the collagen in your skin. It can help build bones in the form of reducing bone loss. And it can help absorb calcium from your, bone, from your digestive system. And this is an important factor because people will take estrogen and say, I'm building up my bones to prevent bone loss, osteoporosis. I say, well, estrogen helps to reduce bone loss, but you need progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA to actually build healthy bone. So they all complement each other in different ways. Protection against cardiovascular disease helps to maintain the vaginal mucosa, and it helps to favorably change the different types of lipid molecules that are concerning for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. There was, I don't think I have it on this list, but when I'm all done with this, there's one more thing I wanted to add as far as a benefit that I just discovered in my literature search earlier today. So it does decrease the risk of stroke, and this is with people who do not have, um, you know, when it's applicable for people who don't have a history of prior stroke, and it does matter by age. And the Women's Health Initiative study that was done way back in 2002 that kind of put concern in all of our minds as far as taking hormones and risk for breast cancer. One other thing that came out of that was that women did not have any improvement as far as stroke was concerned. In fact, they might have seen a little tick up, so they were quick to say, well, see, hormones, hormones aren't good for our brain. The population of women that were studied were an elderly population of women, and there was a long period of time from them going from menopause into taking the hormones. So you can't really use that data to make these comments. There's a lot more studying done and a lot more articles that have been written that actually show that there is benefit. And one of the molecules that really helps the most with stroke is actually progesterone. If you've had a traumatic brain injury, you should go to the ER and I'm just kidding about this. If you, if you go to an ER of the future, they'll give you IV progesterone when you go in with a traumatic brain injury. So if you bonk your head and you need help in the ER, progesterone given right away makes a huge change, reversible changes, and yet we don't do this in the current emergency room. But the emergency room of the future should really have that on hand for people. Okay, so we talked about the brain, the bones, 
you do see reduced risk of certain cancers, uterine, ovarian, and colon cancer. I'll talk about breast cancer in a moment. Eyes, cataract risk seems to go down. And you do tend to have a better balance in your glands as far as acne and hair follicles, sebaceous glands. These all tend to have a, a better profile to not have those unwanted symptoms. So one thing I didn't have on that list that I want to mention right now, so I found an article, November 2018, it was published, and it was a 20-year follow-up study of a large population of women, menopausal women, and what they found, no one's ever studied lung function and estrogen to see if there's a correlation, and what they found is that the women that were given estrogen replacement, and I don't know what kind of molecule of estrogen, okay, so I'm just giving a general statement about estrogen, those women that had estrogen, compared to those that didn't take estrogen, had a slower decline in lung function than those that didn't take it. And then also, if you took it for 10 plus years, you had an even less decline in your lung function. And lung disease, and anything having to do with lung disease, is the fourth killer in the list of mortality, causes of mortality, it's number four. So it doesn't really get talked enough. It, these are not with people who smoke, these are just in general. So your respiratory system can be quite significant to your health outcome. So I found that very interesting. So progesterone has a lot of benefits too. And you know, I'm just gonna tell you that progesterone stands for um, progestational hormone. So one of its main goals is to allow for pregnancy. So I see women who try to get pregnant, and the first thing I want to know is what their cycle is doing and whether they're making enough progesterone. Because you can fertilize an egg, but that egg is going to come along and implant on the lining of the uterus, and there better be enough vessels and vascularity in that lining to grab that fertilized egg and allow it to get the circulation it needs. So if there's not enough progesterone around, that's not going to happen. So it is very, very important. And that's what I was talking about here. It's also very important. It's a natural anti-anxiety and natural brain function supporting hormone. And it tends to balance out the estrogen in many different ways. And it also helps at the breast. So when you have enough progesterone, it helps your breast tissue mature and differentiate. So it tends to be protective against things like breast cancer and abnormal breast tissue changes. And over here you have estrogen can inhibit thyroid action if you have too much of it. But if you have progesterone around, it tends to block it and allow the thyroid to work properly. So I have a lot of people that come in, they're fatigued, they're losing hair, their nails are brittle, their skin is thin, they're gaining weight. They're like, I'm certain I need a thyroid hormone. And I said, well, let's take a look. And lo and behold, they have high estrogen, low progesterone, their thyroid numbers are actually falling within reference range, but they have a pattern that shows me that it's not optimal. But it's not that they need thyroid hormone, they need better hormone balancing, and their adrenal glands need support too. That's gonna make their thyroid hormone work better. So giving somebody thyroid hormone in the wrong setting can actually cause resistance to the hormone replacement over time, and it can actually make the problem worse. So you really have to be careful when you're asking your doctor for thyroid hormone if that's the right answer if you need a lot more than that. So we know from some studies that the vessels in the, in the heart wall can spasm if you don't have enough progesterone around. And it also can cause increased mortality if you give the wrong kind of progesterone. So that Provera molecule that I told you about actually led to more spasms in the cardiac tissue and it caused more problems in the heart. So that molecule really is a dangerous one. It tends to reduce the risk of clog clogging up your vessels. And this is where I was telling you that the MPA, which is medroxyprogesterone, can cause vasospasm, and it can increase the clogging of those vessels a little bit more. And it tends to be protective against autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders seem to correlate with increased estrogen. So there's a lot more information. There's sugar control you get from progesterone. It stimulates your bone to build more bone. It helps with fat metabolism. It helps with migraines that you get before your period starts. It helps to protect against some of the cancer-promoting genes. It helps to stimulate that to protect you. And it also tends to help you with 
your facial acne and whiskers, it tends to help reduce prostate cancer. And if you don't have enough progesterone, you can have a lot of these symptoms. In other words, the opposite of its benefits. All right, so testosterone, very helpful to the body. Men make it from the testicles. Women make it from the ovaries and adrenals. And they, it's an anabolic steroid. It helps us build muscle. It helps us get, have, be strong. It helps us improve protein. And it helps us with libido and erectile function. And I found this very interesting. I don't know if you have children, but it, before puberty, boys and girls have the same low blood levels of testosterone. Not until puberty that they uh, change. And I found that interesting. I have two kids that are about 19 months apart. And when I read that, I was paying a little bit closer attention to them as they were growing. And I would say that, yeah, they're both kind of androgynous up until about 11. <laughs> then all of a sudden, they went their own ways. OK, so again, testosterone just provides many different things sexually. It helps to control blood flow to the penile. Corp corporocavernosa area to help with erections and engorgement in the clitoral area as well. Helps to improve muscle size and strength and reduces adipose cells around the breast and abdomen. So a lot of men that are having extra weight around their bellies and they have low testosterone, I, give, I have a pretty low threshold to give them some testosterone to help them with weight management. And we do other things too, but that does help them. And you know, builds bone, improves some of the cholesterol markers, improves sugar, improves mood, and so anyway, bioidentical hormones, this is kind of an explanation of why you would use bioidentical hormones. They're biologically the same as what your body makes. Why give something foreign and different when you can actually give what your body is used to seeing? And in Europe, it's actually been used over 60 years. That's what they primarily use. And that medroxy progesterone molecule I was telling you about is banned in Europe. You can't even get it. In some parts of Asia, you cannot get it either. So why we still offer it in this country? Big pharma. But you can choose not to take it, so that's good news. All right, so the WHI scare 2002. So Women's Health Initiative scared all these women. Uh, this is July 2002. I was the only female doctor in my all-male practice. And all of these women came rushing to see me when all of their doctors cold turkey stopped their hormones. And these women were very symptomatic. They had been taking hormones for a long time. And they came to me and they said, I don't care if I get breast cancer in five years. I'm ready to kill my boss. I'm ready to kill my husband. I'm ready to kill my kids. You better give me my hormones back or there's gonna be some serious issue here today. I'm like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how old I was. I was 32. <laughs> I was not having any hormonal issues in my life, but I was really impressed by the fact that women needed an answer. So the first thing I did was I dropped their original dose down by 50%. I said, okay, less is probably better, and then let me navigate my way around your choices. And that's when I learned about bioidentical hormones. I didn't even know from my conventional training what it was. And you may find that when you talk to some doctors, they're gonna say, I don't believe in bioidentical hormones. And I say, okay, this is not a religion. This is not a belief system. This is biochemistry. Bioidentical horm hormones are chemistry, biochemistry. These are molecules we make. Yes, I understand we weren't taught the difference in our conventional training, but there is a difference. So this is just a lot of information about the Women's Health Initiative. And there were multiple flaws. I had mentioned to you earlier that there was an elderly population of patients. These were women who had not taken any hormones, and now they were put on hormones. And the group that was most at risk that had to stop early were the PremPro group. So the Premarin plus the Provera. The Premarin only arm, which were the women who had hysterectomies, that study continued to the very end. And there actually was not an increased risk of breast cancer, even with the synthetically altered Premarin. So really, the medroxyprogesterone ended up being the most problematic part of this study. But since then, we've had a lot more studies. And what we do know is that there tends to be a trend up here that there's protection against the coronary heart disease that was observed in both studies. And over time, participants discontinue their medications, consistently increasing rate um, of 50% non-adherent treatment by end of study. So in other words, about 50% 
of the people who enrolled were not adherent. So now we're looking at the 50% that continued. That's a huge population bias that wasn't even factored in originally. I mentioned that it was an older menopausal woman with a big gap between hormones, and many conclusions from this study can be applied to a specific group of women, but not all women. And the world literature, there's actually 51, there's more than 51 studies. When I did this slide presentation, this was out until about 2014, and we have more. But what we do know is there's a right time to start hormones. There's a right length of time to be on hormones. There are definitely things you should not be doing while you're taking hormones. And there was no effect if somebody had a family history of breast cancer of whether or not that particular patient can take it. So if you hear, well, my, my mom, my sister, my daughter has a history of breast cancer, what about me? The answer is, well, I'm going to take you individually and find out what the link is because a lot of the time it's not genetic. 90% of the time it's not genetic. So there is a lot of flexibility for the patient that's sitting in front of me that I can offer them some hormonal restoration. And so all of this tends to give us a lot of very helpful information instead of this very dangerous statement that you cannot take hormones, they're gonna cause cancer, they're gonna cause a stroke. Those kinds of comments cannot, they're, they're not true. And so a lot more information about the Women's Health Initiative and breast cancer risk. And I just wanna summarize that based on all of the data that we have, um, it says here that I mentioned before, epidemiological data indicate that a positive family history of breast cancer should not be a contraindication to the use of postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. Women who develop breast cancer while using hormone replacement therapy have a reduced risk of dying of their breast cancer, likely because increased surveillance and early detection and an effect of pre-existing tumors so that tumors appear at a less virulent and aggressive stage. So, there are things that you can come down with, but when you have the hormones, it tends to be more favorable. But also the literature does seem to support that there is not an increased risk with bioidentical hormones, but that, lim that data is limited in this country because big pharma doesn't make bioidentical hormones. Compounding pharmacies make it, and you can buy some of it over the counter uh, in the form of progesterone topically. Okay. So again, I just, I wanna draw this, I wanna talk about this. So literature sufficiently strong enough to share with patients various explanations for reports regarding breast cancer and hormone replacement therapy, and helpful to emphasize possibility that studies reflect effect of hormone replacement therapy on pre-existing tumors, and that hormone users who develop breast cancer have a reduced risk of dying of breast cancer because their tumors are better differentiated, they're more localized, and they're smaller. So this is taken from um, doc Dr. Spiroff is kind of the textbook, textbook guru, and he's very conservative when it comes to answering the question of whether women can take hormones and the risk for cancer. And I liked this statement because he's basically saying, Yes, have the conversation with your patients. They should know that you know taking hormones does not lead to dying of breast cancer. You know you need to take each patient individually and talk to them. So bioidentical hormones come in many different ways. You can have a slow release capsule, a vaginal cream, transdermal creams to put anywhere else on the skin, gels, patches, injections, sublingual drops and trochee and pellets. Um, men have um, injectable forms. They have topical gels and they have injections of testosterone and they have pellets. Those would probably be the most common delivery methods. Uh, women, excuse me, men will usually maybe start with a topical gel and they feel they want better results. So we'll go on to injections about once a week and then they get tired of injecting and then they'll go on to getting pellets a lot of the time where they, we insert it just underneath the skin and it slowly releases over the course of three to four months. So they just have to come in about three to four months to get that done. And women can get pellets too. So these are the different types of bioidentical hormones. We mentioned the three estrogens progesterone, DHEA, testosterone. You also have bioidentical thyroid hormones. You have bioidentical cortisol. And prednisone is not bioidentical, but hydrocortisone is. And melatonin and growth hormone. 
So these are all considered, even vitamin D is considered a pro-hormone because it can build hormones. And if you look at its structure, it looks very similar to the backbone of these other hormones. So these are my basic general health recommendations. Important to live a healthy lifestyle, healthy weight, regular exercise aerobically and weight-bearing exercise, regular exams and screening tests, comprehensive blood work, daily high-quality multivitamin I think is a really good idea. Finding the right one though, you should partner with someone who knows a little bit more about advanced nutrition because there are many different multivitamin, multimineral formulas. And a lot of them over the counter do not absorb very well, so you need something a little bit higher quality. Bone health supplement, so maybe something that has some calcium, some vitamin D, some vitamin K, some boron, silica, things like that. Avoid antacids and acid blockers because these can prevent you from absorbing your minerals, calcium and magnesium and your iron. Those don't get absorbed, and, and proteins aren't absorbed very well either. And as, you're, as you start blocking the acid in your stomach, that is an antimicrobial bar barrier for you. So when you can eat a contaminated food, which happens all the time, it's just a matter of how much it's contaminated and determining how sick you might be. When you drop that into an, a stomach that doesn't have very much acid, it allows those microbial agents to keep on going, and they can start producing and cause incredible imbalance. So our stomach acid is around a pH of two. This is one area where you want it to be acidic. You start taking these blockers and your pH will go up to about a four or five, and that's a huge difference, and it takes away a lot of its normal function by doing that. So I recommend some digestive enzymes, some probiotics. You can use apple cider vinegar diluted with water. All of these tend to help people who have acid reflux. Um, trimethylglycine or TMG is another natural agent you can use to help with stomach um, acid or what you think is stomach acid burn. It could be low acid burn too. Determine your hormonal status with accurate testing. Consider bioidentical hormone restoration therapy and partner with a knowledgeable provider. Here are some resources. Uh, Dr. John Lee was a family medicine doctor and he's written a series of books that say what your doctor may not tell you about blank. So what your doctor may not tell you about menopause, what your doctor may not tell you about breast cancer. So he has a series of books. He's since passed away, but I love that he's a family doctor who just came across bioidentical hormones in a rather random fashion, and he clearly saw that those were better molecules than the synthetics. Dr. James Wilson, Adrenal Fatigue Syndrome is a great book about how to heal your adrenal glands. And the Bioidentical White Pages article, if you were to Google this, you can find that if you want to delve into a little bit more detail than what I talked about. The Institute for Functional Medicine, I think, is always a nice resource. It talks about how to heal the body from the cell out, from the organ system out. And the Anti-Aging Academy, is, is something very helpful too. And then Life Extension Foundation. Any Life Extension Foundation members in the audience? One? Just one. Well, Life Extension has a membership and they have a lot of great uh, magazines and articles. And they have, it's a nonprofit organization and their board of directors is the who's who of integrative and anti-aging medicine. These are all very top-notch people who know their stuff. So I think it's a great resource. So at the end of my lecture, I always post a picture. This is us. We went to Huatulco, Mexico. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Huatulco, Mexico, but it's as far south in Mexico on the Pacific Ocean side as Cancun is on the Caribbean side. So very far, but we had never been on that side. So we were on our way. The beautiful mountain ranges in the background. It's my daughter, Melina, my son, Lucas, my husband, Mike. So we were on our way to a beautiful waterfall, Las Brisas, waterfall and we just had a wonderful time getting there and we had a wonderful day and it was just it was a beautiful vacation but it's it's a nice place to visit so oops oh, my last slide so i'm i'm a faculty member here i am <laughs> i'm a faculty member at the susan samueli integrative health institute work there part time with with a number of wonderful staff that we have there and so I'm very thankful to be working there and to continue to grow integrative medicine and teaching the medical students and the residents and also other 
fellow colleagues of mine, I recently met with some oncologists to do more integrative cancer therapy for patients. So patients don't have to feel like they're in the middle. A lot of times my patients get so discouraged, they go see their conventional doctors and then they come and see me. And they're like, I don't know what to do. You tell me one thing, my other doctor tells me another. And so I oftentimes pick up the phone and I really try to bridge that gap and try to do some education of how we can work together on behalf of our mutual patient. So thank you very much. Appreciate your attention.